Welcome everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We are, um, we'll wait just another minute. So we've still got a couple of people joining. Okay, so welcome. Um, there are a couple of points, if um, I may. So please, can you all stay on mute to start with? Um, and then we can just focus on the talk. If you have any questions going through, just pop them in the chat, or you can see at the bottom of the slide there, there's our email address. So if you have any larger questions, then please feel free to um, email us and then we can respond. And if we don't get a chance to go through all of the questions at the Q&A at the end, then we'll of course follow up um, by email. So this session is being recorded. So get a chance um, to stay until the end, then we will follow up um, again at your leisure. Um, I hope that works. So I will introduce our two speakers. So who are we to start with? We are the Waste Partnership um, and we're the partnership of all 11 districts and boroughs as well as the County Council in Hertfordshire, set up in 1992 um, to reduce the amount of waste that's created and encourage recycling. So between us, um, we're responsible for providing waste management services for over 1.1 million residents, 490,000 households across the county. Um, the team seeks to reduce waste by encouraging positive uh, behaviour change across all residents. We're a very active group. Um, and show you just one of the elements that we do. We have a load of different events coming up this week and I will share a link um, at the end to share more about that. Um, so our speakers today, we have David Burley. Um, he has a 40 year career which began in the voluntary sector before a move to the Home Office where he helped set up the charity Crime Concern, which is now Joined Friends of the Earth in 1990 to develop the pioneering Recycling City initiative before moving on to become a trainer at RAPS Recycling Managers course. In 2012, he took time out to work as protocol manager at the London 2012 Olympic Games before joining Broxbourne Council, where he became senior recycling officer. And in 2020, um, April last year, he joined the Hearts, Hearts Hartfordshire Waste Partnership as the second Waste Aware Coordinator. We also have Duncan Jones, who is a Chartered Resources and Waste Manager and member of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management with over 26 years experience, covering a range of disciplines from client side roles through to senior leadership positions in direct service organisations successfully working across two tier structures. As well as being the Partnership Development Manager for the Waste Partnership, Duncan is Chairman of the award winning Hertfordshire Fly Tipping Group a multi-agency task force in addition to Hertfordshire's 11 local authorities. This includes the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner, the Hertfordshire Constabulary, Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue, the Environment Agency and the National Fire Department. And we actually have a talk specifically on the group um, taking place tomorrow. So if that interests you, then um, I'll share details. David and Duncan, over to you. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everybody. So um, you've had the introduction. I just want to expand on some of that to, to give uh, some further context for what we're about to tell you this morning. So as Helena um, uh, introduced us, we're the Harpshire Waste Partnership. Um, Harpshire has 11 waste authorities. Uh, the County Council is what we call a waste disposal authority. And the boroughs and districts are waste collection authorities. And those are roles that are defined in law by the Environmental Protection Act 1990. So what that means is legally, um, boroughs and districts do not have any powers of disposal, which is why um, when they collect uh, residual waste um, from uh, households in Hertfordshire, they legally have to pass that waste onto the county council to arrange for um, its disposal. By the same token, the county council um, largely doesn't have any powers of collection, uh, which is why those services are vested in the boroughs and districts. Um, annually, we currently spend just over 88 million pounds a year on that combined service. About 46.6 million pounds of that money goes on waste disposal services. So that covers things like the, um, the cost of disposing of residual waste. Oh, 
stop sharing there, David. Could you put the screen back? David, I'll I'll take it from here. I'll um, I'll share my screen, and then you can uh, once you've got if you bear with us, folks. Technology is wonderful, but it uh, it can let you down every now and then. Bear with me. A Sorry second. about that. So I don't know what's happened. The um it just the connection just broke i'm afraid okay no i bear with me a second i'm almost there okay we should be back up and running i'll, I'll control it from here david um, okay so as i was saying uh of the 88 million about 46 million uh, pounds is spent on waste disposal that covers the disposal of residual waste um as well as the processing of organic wastes um and the payment of recycling credits um, to the bars and districts um, it also covers things like the uh, provision of the network of household waste recycling centres, as well as some long-term um, closed landfill services. In 2019-20, we recycled and composted together 52.3% um, of the 500,000 tonnes of household waste arising throughout the county each year. Um, that's our best rate ever. Uh, to give you some context, the old UK struck European target was to recycle 50% by 2020, which we achieved um, actually a few years ago. Um, but we are now already starting to work towards um, the uh, new target, which we think the government will confirm shortly, which is a 65% recycling target by 2035. And pleasingly within that, we already have two authorities, um, Three Rivers and St Albans, that are quite close to those 2035 targets already. Uh, in fact, uh, for 2019-20, Three Rivers was England's top uh, performing uh, district council in terms of recycling and composting performance at number one. Uh, and number five in that same table last year was um, St Albans. Uh, so we are waiting with bated breath to see what happens during uh, 2021 when the final results are due out later towards the end of the summer. But for me, perhaps a more amazing statistic given where we've come from over the last 12, 13 years, is that in 2019-20, for every 100 tonnes of household waste arising, either at the curbside um, or through the network of household waste recycling centres, which we have now recently rebranded just as recycling centres, we diverted through recycling, composting, um, and our existing use of some regional energy waste facilities, which we'll explain later on, we diverted just under 84% from every 100 tonnes which I frankly think is, a, is an amazing statistic. Okay, David, I think the next slide is yours. So I will- Thank you. There we go. Yes, so just to um, survey what we're going to cover in today's presentation, we're going to start by looking what's in the, what's in the typical Hertfordshire rubbish bin. And we're going to use some research that we've recently undertaken to uh, help that little exploration. Then we're going to look in a little bit more detail about how we're doing at recycling and uh, how much more we're recycling over the years and how we're wasting less. And then a topical issue, where does the rubbish and recycling actually go? Uh, a lot of people are skeptical about um, where the recycling and uh, rubbish materials actually end up. Um, we know where our material goes and uh, we'll share that with you. And then finally, um, we're going to look to the future and consider how knowing uh, a little bit about what's in our bins helps us shape Hertfordshire's waste policy uh, and helps it respond to current government consultations on the direction of the waste management sector. So I think back to you, Duncan, for the next slide. Thanks, David. So um, one of the key exercises um, in informing today's presentation, and actually, as David says, in informing our future waste policy in Hertfordshire, is something that we call waste composition analysis. And literally, we, um, through September to October uh, last year, collected samples from four different waste streams um, throughout Hertfordshire, covering 10 out of the 11 partner authorities. Uh, these were samples collected from a range of different ACORN groups. That's, that's a classification system used for making sure we achieve a, a representative sample um, of Hertfordshire households um, from nine of the Bowdoin districts plus um, operations at the County Council's recycling centres. That waste was taken to a sorting facility, which in essence was a great big shed in, in Waterdale, um, in near Watford, near our transfer station there. 
where a team of pickers literally sorted that material by hand into um, something like 48, 50 odd different categories. Um, and that produced a number of reports. So each partner authority taking part in that analysis has been given their own individual reports that look at and break down what's in their residual waste, um, what is in their recycling waste, uh, what is in their litter waste uh, and in their litter waste stream as well. Um, I've mentioned 10 out of the 11, Watford didn't take part in the exercise, no skullduggery there, simply by, um, simply reflects the fact that in um, 2019, in preparation for a service change that they rolled out um, in September last year, was due to be June, but COVID um, delayed that by three months. Um, they'd already undertaken a very, very similar analysis, uh, actually conducted by the same company, funny enough, so the the there was a very good alignment between the methods used. And therefore, it didn't make any sense simply to repeat the exercise less than 12 months on. So um, the report that has been produced by um, that exercise is, if you like, the backing data, the source data um, for what you're about to see. I have to think back to me now, Duncan. So, yes, so here's, here's the headline, essentially. Um, when we merge all the findings that Duncan's just been referring to, we can get what is in effect the contents of the average Hertfordshire waste bin. Uh, and so we can see that um, perhaps an eighth or so of the contents of the average waste bin are what we call dry recyclables. We'll go into this in a little bit more detail on the next slide. <clears throat> but these are typical recyclable materials that have found their way into the, into the waste bin. Um, perhaps slightly more surprisingly to, uh, uh, to, to people not familiar with the, with the, with the delights of the waste bin, um, a, a significant uh, proportion of the waste, nearly a third, uh, is made up of recyclable organics, that's garden waste and food waste. And as, as we'll see, this finding is also very influential in the, in the future direction of our waste management uh, uh, policies. Um, and then um, perhaps comfortingly, um, significantly more than half of the contents of the typical waste bin are uh, what we call non-recyclable waste, waste at least, which is not targeted for recycling in, this, in the house-to-house in -house schemes of boxes and bins to collect targeted recyclables. So we can have the next slide, Duncan. I'll continue with a little uh, look in more detail at what's actually in the dry recycling. So here we can see that um, the dry recycling, which is still in the rubbish bin, in the typical Hertfordshire rubbish bin, is made up roughly of equal proportions of the main uh, materials that are targeted for recycling. M many of you watching this will be very familiar with these and no doubt are assiduously recycling these items. But um, small but significant quantities of them remain in the refuse bin. So you can see the familiar types there, the newspapers and magazines making up uh, 3% of the total typical bin, uh, plastic bottles and tubs, a similar proportion, slightly less card and cardboard, glass bottles, slightly less. Um, the typical sorts of materials that are still finding their way into the bin. Uh, and so the question immediately arises, what does this mean? What does the presence of this dry recycling in the, in the typical refuse bin mean for the performance of our recycling schemes? And the next slide, Duncan, I think is you exploring that very question. Can you hear me, Duncan? I can hear you. I'm just um, trying, to on. The, I'm trying to get the, the next slide to uh, roll over. Here we go. Right. Um, OK, so let's take a bit, a more, a bit more of an in-depth look at what we're talking about um, in terms of our actual... Oh, oh sorry. My fault. About um, our current recycling performance. So we're now talking about... Um, the key materials. Some of you will be aware that the government is currently consulting on standardizing the range, not the method, but the range of materials to be collected from uh, every household um, in England and Wales with similar proposals also muted for um, Scotland. Um, so these are the main categories here, uh, plastics, metals, uh, fiber, uh, which includes newspapers, magazines, junk mail, cardboard and covered boxes and glass bottles and jars. 
Now the capture rate. The capture rate is a function of being able to measure both what we um, throw away in our residual waste and what we currently recycle. By adding those two together, we can determine what the capture rate is each for each, for each of the key materials. So for metals, uh, which includes cans and tins and aerosols, um, between the residual and the recycling waste streams, we know we capture for recycling 70.33%, uh, uh, with just under 30% remaining um, in, the, in the refuse bin, in the residual waste bin, what some people refer to as the black bin, although um, black, bin, black. <laughs> uh, black bins are, are not necessarily standard across the country. Um, and then if you move through those different materials, you're looking at plastic bottles, pots, tubs and trays, um, just under 75% capture, newspapers, magazines, junk mail, 77, carbon and cardboard boxes, 87%. And the one that really stands out for us in Hertfordshire is that uh, we currently capture 92.5% of all glass bottles and jars um, from the, the, uh, between the recycling and the residual waste streams. Now, what does this mean in terms of policy? So if I'm an individual borough, and we, and we have this analysis per borough as well, and as you would anticipate, um, some of these numbers change a little bit depending on which borough you're in. So the analysis you're seeing here is, is a county-wide average. But for example, you know, if you were looking at um, what your priority should be for a, a communications program, you could see through this sort of data that on a county-wide basis, we'd be looking to really stimulate and try and up our performance in terms of a capture of metals and plastic bottles, where our two biggest gaps are currently compared to the other materials. Um, so you can start to see how the production and validation of the data starts to inform um, how and where we spend money not only in terms of the physical physical co collection of material, but also in terms of the priority messages that we design in terms of our annual communications campaigns, both at a county level um, and at a district level, with a trick being to make sure that we, we line up and, and those are all pulling in the same direction. Right, next slide. And it's to back, handed back to me. It is a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest. This is in the 1950s. <laughs> Anyway, we'll, 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 tr we'll try our best. Um, so, uh, yes, turning back to the contents of the bin and the next fraction that we want to consider is the, is the, um, the organics fraction. And, and perhaps the, the outstanding uh, finding here, uh, and, and anybody who watched the Prue Leith uh, program on Channel 4 last night won't be surprised by this if they, if they had been surprised before. Um, is the is the very significant presence of what we call avoidable food waste in the in the organic fraction in the typical bin? Almost a quarter of the total uh, bin waste by weight is what we call avoidable food waste. And avoidable food waste is food uh, food that could have been eaten if it hadn't been thrown away. So it isn't it isn't bones, it isn't scraps, it isn't peelings, it isn't plate scrapings bread, it's fruit, it's vegetables, it's, it's meat that has simply been thrown away. Some of it, a very significant quantity of it actually, um, still in its packaging. Um, so uh, we, we've known for some time that this is an area that we need to look at and need to look at in a more systematic way. But this finding has been a really dramatic, uh, a, 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 a dr dramatic confirmation of, of what we had suspected. Uh, and, it, and it is, as we will see later on, um, informing our, our future policy. Um, but to have a look at what it means in terms of how uh, those councils that have food waste collections are actually performing, um, we can turn to the next slide, Duncan, and you can take us through that, if you would. Yeah, bear with me a second. I'm just, um, I've just been trying to catch up with the chat. Bear with me a second. Ah, you're multitasking, that's... Uh... Trying. So... <laughs> so as david as david noted um food waste is is a is a organic waste food waste is a massive part um of what we have to deal with um in our residual bin food waste is roughly just under a third uh, of what's in there and that's really quite important because if you think about the upstream um, carbon impacts uh, of food waste production in terms of energy um the impact on the environment uh, um, water consumption all those sorts of things um, there's a real um, issue with the amount of food waste that we still throw away in this country. So we wanted just to highlight some of these success stories that we, we've achieved so far um, 
but without resting on the laurels. So at the time this analysis was done, of the 10 boroughs and districts in Hertfordshire that um, uh, have responsibility for waste collection, five of them um, also provide a dedicated uh, service for food waste. And you can see here that performance ranges from um, Broxbourne recycling just under 37% of their food waste, um, all the way up to St. Albans, which is um, achieving a, a food waste recycling um, rate of just under 60%. Um, uh, three Rivers up there, 50%. Again, Three Rivers and St. Albans in the top 10, England's top 10 uh, for 2019-20, and will be again, we believe, for 2020-21 when those results are finalised. But it also emphasises how much food waste is still left in the uh, residual bin. And the red bars there, um, based on some national definitions, um, indicate how much of that food waste is avoidable in terms of food waste that has been purchased and simply not used, it's been thrown away, uh, typically in response to a, a use-by date or a sell-by date, um, with a small fraction noted in the grey bars there that are unavoidable, things like um, carcasses and bones and, and things where they, they have genuinely come to the end of their, their useful life. And again, one of the questions we, we regularly get in presentations is under, under a climate change context, what, what's, the, what's the kind of actions that we can take as individuals to really try and improve our carbon footprint? And, and food waste, um, by, by far and away, is one of those actions that, you know, th there's no interventions that are really required by local government. Um, there are some that we think central government could do, but, you know, you don't need your local council to help you start minimising the amount of food waste that you have. Um, we can certainly help, and we've got lots of resources to do things like, you know, leftover recipes and reusing um, food, et cetera, et cetera. But it's actually one of the biggest things we can, we can get the public to do that not only improves our collective carbon footprint, but also would save significant sums of money um, if we were able to drive down the amount of food waste in the residual waste stream. To, to put it in proportion, if I was to add up the remaining dry recyclables in the um, residual waste stream and then compare that to the amount of food waste in the residual waste stream, food waste would outweigh everything else. Uh, so for us, one of our key objectives going forward is to really um, make further inroads into the remaining food waste that's in our residual waste stream. It's one of the biggest challenges we face, not only in Hertfordshire, but across the country as a whole. All right, should we go to the next slide, David? Yes, please. All right, bear with me a second. Here we go. Yes, well, thank you, Duncan, for that uh, um, examination of the organic fraction. And we're, we're now turning to the third element of that uh, pie that we saw right at the beginning, which is the non-recyclable waste. Uh, and that, um, looking at that in some detail, also has a great deal of interest and also helps to inform our policy um, going forwards. Um, again, there's a, there's a standout element in the, in the typical bin, and that is the, and that is the presence of disposable nappies, uh, which uh, represents uh, over 8% of the average contents of the typical bin. And of course, if you bear in mind that perhaps only 12% uh, of Hertfordshire residents um, uh, have uh, households have a child in nappies. Um, obviously, for those families, the presence of uh, disposable nappies in the in the bin, um, fortunately, though though weighty, not high volume. Otherwise, people would uh, there would be a serious problem with people not uh, being able to get their waste in their bins. But the weight of uh, of disposable nappies in uh, of, 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 uh, in the bins of families who have children in in nappies and are using disposables will be very more more considerably more than that. So so uh, in a way, the averaging is is perhaps understating the the challenge that some people will face. And we'll say a little bit more about disposable nappies uh, a little bit later in the um, in the presentation, or or, or at least what uh, what we're we're doing to try and uh, uh, encourage people to think about using reusable nappies. Um, other components in the in the in the waste stream include um, the. Uh, uh, again, uh, items that people will be familiar with, but perhaps might not be aware of the of the overall presence. Plastic bags and plastic wrappings uh, similarly represent a large uh, proportion of the 
uh, of the currently non-recyclable component of the waste stream and certain types of plastic packaging such as polystyrene cups and uh, cushioning for uh, home delivery, um, a very significant proportion of the waste stream, these, these materials are not readily recyclable at the moment, therefore go in, are counted as residual waste. Uh, and then quite significant quantities of non-recyclable paper. Um, some of this, as with the organic fraction, as Duncan was discussing, uh, it, you know, is amenable to, to personal um, purchasing decisions and things like that, less amenable to the local authorities' range of waste management strategies. Um, and we will say a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. But now we can, we can um, wrap up this, uh, this consideration of how well the recycling uh, performance is and how well the waste management performance is by looking at a, a summary, a series of summary charts, and I'll hand back to Duncan to do that. Okay, let's move forward. I think you had that one a minute ago. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, there are four charts here which really summarise the performance of the partnership. Uh, that's the 11 authorities working together um, uh, since 2010-11. Um, the first one is the top one in the top left, total household waste. So total household waste is our recycling, our composting, and our residual waste all added together, collected at the curbside and through street letter bins, uh, would include fly tipping and all the waste arisings at the network of recycling centres, of which there are officially 17 across the county. Um, under a climate change context, in terms of waste management, what we're looking for is reductions in the total household waste per household or per head of population, whichever way you want to, 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 to equate it um, across the long term. There is absolutely no point in recycling and composting more of an increasing waste stream. Um, that, that's a false economy. So what we ideally want to see is that we were recycling and composting much more of a decreasing waste stream going forward. Now we measure it per head, and per household, because ultimately, if you bear in mind in Hertfordshire over the next 25 years, um, we are likely to see the, additional, the addition of around 80 to 90,000 new households. So that's, you know, that's, a, that's, that's you know, two new block spawns being built or you know, you know, one, one point, one and a half decorums being built, depending on how you want to look at it, um, over the next 25 years. And therefore, physically, we'll be handling more tonnage. But what we then do is we, 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 we use these metrics to try and determine what the actual trend is. And we can see that in Hertfordshire since 2010-11, the trend for total household waste um, is going down, uh, which is what we want to see. A lot of climate change commentators now talk about uh, uh, reducing our consumption by half in order to get ahead of the climate change curve, as it were. Uh, and you can see through the top left-hand graph here that that's exactly what we're trying to do in Hertfordshire, and so far um, we've achieved. It will be really interesting to see what happens when we are able to add in the finalised data for 2020-21, given the impact of COVID, which has had some very interesting um, uh, uh, impacts on our waste operations. If I can move to the top right, that's the overall uh, HWP recycling rate, which you can see since 27-08 uh, uh, has... Um, increased generally um, up to its current levels, um, but with much more um, to go. Uh, and again, with a declining total household waste figure, that's exactly what you want to see. You want to you, you want the partnership, uh, a borough or a county, to recycling more of a decreasing um, uh, household waste stream. The graph on the bottom left um, that breaks down the overall recycling performance into dry recycling, as demonstrated in blue. Uh, the blue line there uh, with the green line representing organics. And you can actually see that the long-term trend for organics is down. Now, organics is slightly, is slightly different uh, in that the organics level is mainly a function of our weather patterns um, and the amount of tonnage that, in essence, grows each year and then is then cut down um, by residents and put into their organic waste collection. Um, um, uh, collections which operate 
uniformly um, um, across the county. One, one interesting question here, one, one of the questions I also get um, when, when we do these presentations is that doesn't the imposition of charges for garden waste result in a lot less tonnage? Uh, and to be blunt, the answer is no. We know that from the waste composition analysis um, that for those authorities in Hertfordshire that charge for garden waste, they capture 97 Point one percent um, of the available garden waste um, that there is there to, 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 to capture at the curbside. Um, we know that if you don't charge, there is a very marginal in increase in that capture to ninety-seven point six percent. But in terms of tonnage, it, it's 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 not material in policy terms, um, and therefore largely that, that downward trend in that green line for organics is a reflection of, of where the pattern is going forward. And funny enough, to a much shallower extent, we, we, we started to see something similar uh, in a separate analysis that David and I run that looks at food waste. And then we end up with the, the graph on the bottom right hand side where we look at our residual waste per household, which like total household waste, we want to see on a continuous downward trend. Um, and you can see there's been quite a substantial reduction in the amount of residual waste per household over the last um, 10 and 11 years. Um, again, key point here is that under a climate change context, that once you've recycled as much as you can, once you've captured as much organics for composting and energy recovery, and by energy recovering organics, I mean anaerobic digestion, uh, which is what we do with our food waste in Hertfordshire, as you'll see in a second. Um, once you've done that, and then with residual waste, the idea is to recover as much value as possible. All right, shall we move on to the next slide? Um, well, well, you raised an interesting point, actually, Duncan, just before we go on to the next slide, we might want to just go back if you can, if you can manage it and just look again at the organic slide, uh, because that I should have made the point at the time um, that the presence of garden waste alongside the food waste um, in the in the waste composition studies, the point that you've just made was confirmed in those in those in those studies it's uh, you can see that the fraction of garden waste in the in the in the overall uh, makeup of the residual bin is very small so so um, this this is a success story the the, the, the the garden waste amount varies according to the season as Duncan was saying very little of the garden waste ends up in the bin the the challenge for us in terms of organics it, is the focus on the food waste so yeah, just absolutely. I should have made that point at the time. Thanks for covering it. In That's that. okay. So, so, this, yes. so this slide here, it just tries to summarize um, the, the waste management methods that we actually have employed um, since um, well over the majority of the last 10 years. And you can see here that the top light blue line, depending on your screen uh, bar, uh, is landfill. And you can see up until 2016, 17, there were annual reductions each year in the amount that is sent to landfill. That has crept up slightly um, in the last three years as we've had to manage um, different types of regional energy from waste contracts where we've been sending Hartford's residual waste, that's waste that's not been recycled or compost by residents uh, for final disposal. But compared to 2012, 13 and the years before, our use of landfill uh, is, is significantly reduced. Energy recovery, for again, for that element, not recycled or compost, we've seen a big increase in that since 2012-13, although again, going slightly down in recent years. Um, and we'll come on to a map that sort of demonstrates that in, in a better way for you. Uh, the, the green bar is our composting, um, which again, even, even given it's a slightly downward trend, um, you can see is, is now a mainstay of our approach to um, managing the waste from Hertfordshire each year. Uh, and with recycling um, as well, slightly on an increasing trend up, uh, up until 2019-20. Um, um, you can't actually see it other than maybe on the year 2012-13. There is a very, very tiny dark blue line on the bottom of that bar, which is reuse. It's very small because I think our total uh, countywide reuse um, is something like 1,500, 2,000 tonnes. And simply given the the, the scale of the times that we're talking about, because each one of these bars represents about 500,000 tons. You can see that reuse, um, whilst it is there, uh, it is present uh, in proportion to the other methods, um, is not very high at all. And that's something that you know, UK as a whole, not just in Hertfordshire, 
has to fundamentally change as part of the new national waste strategy. So, moving on to the Great. next section. Thank you, thank you, Duncan. Yes, yeah, so we've looked at we've looked at some what's in the waste, and we've looked at um, how effective, in statistical terms, we are in terms of our um, uh, efforts to uh, minimise waste and divert waste into recycling. But where does the rubbish and the recycling actually go? Um, so, first of all, a reminder of how we actually how we actually treat the materials. Uh, the, 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 the rubbish, in this case, it's in a blue bin, is collected on a, on a typical uh, refuse truck. And then moving clockwise, it, the material may be taken to a transfer station to be bulked up. Um, then moving down to the next uh, slide, the majority of waste, as we've just seen in Hertfordshire, is taken to energy from waste plants where uh, the, the, uh, the material is incinerated. Um, there may be some recovery of metals at that point, but we strongly recommend people to segregate their metals rather than rely on any process that there might be as uh, energy from waste plants. But the, this does at least, these plants do at least have the virtue of recovering energy by burning the, uh, the material and generating power through that. Uh, but a significant proportion in the final slide of the material still goes to, as we saw in the previous slide, still ends up in landfill sites. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see that the journey of the waste represented um, graphically, as it were. And you can see that there are uh, centres across the county where material, where waste material is concentrated, including waste material that may be taken to the network of recycling centres that we have. Uh, that material is concentrated and then transferred to facilities. Uh, and as you can see, um, all the facilities uh, for the final uh, treatment of the residual waste, the bin waste, lie outside the county. Uh, we've, we've, not, uh, we've not succeeded in, in uh, finding locations that uh, are acceptable to the local, local community for us to manage our waste in Hertfordshire. So the material, whether it's going to an energy from waste plant, which most of it is, or to landfill sites, uh, leaves the county for that, uh, for that final disposal uh, and you can see the uh, the, the range of uh, facilities that we're we're uh, providing so that's the that's the uh, residual waste the rubbish if you like what about the dry recycling what happens to that um, we're going to try a rather ambitious thing in the next slide uh, Duncan which is to show a video but so uh, we'll do a little little bit of talking about it first before we click on the video um, so yes if we look at um, if we look at where does the recycling go, again, it's collected. Uh, it, you, you may put all your dry recyclable materials into a single, into a single uh, bin, or you might put them into boxes. Um, uh, some of them, some councils collect all the dry recycling mixed together. Some uh, do some segregations of the, of the different materials at the, at the curbside. If they do the latter, going clockwise around the, around the um, presentation, the material will be concentrated in depots and then taken off to facilities to be reprocessed. Uh, but uh, in all cases, plastics and cans are collected, mixed, and in some cases, plastics, cans, paper, cardboard and glass are collected, mixed. And if we click on the, uh, uh, on the, vid on, on the video link now, uh, Duncan, um, we should be able to see um, what happens in the materials facility that uh, a lot of material collected in Hertfordshire goes to the Pierce plant near St Albans. Can you do that for me please? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And thanks to our colleagues at Pierce for putting that video together for us at very short notice, very uh, a lightning tour of what happens to the different materials at a sorting plant. But you can see at the very end there, um, baled materials being loaded onto a vehicle. And the next three slides in the middle show those sorts of materials reaching their final processing destination. So glass, for example, paper uh, and baled cans. And th th those materials, many of them in the United Kingdom, are then turned into new bottles and jars, newsprint and other paper materials, and, and new cans as shown in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the pictures across the bottom. Um, so uh, uh, if we move to the next slide. Um, oh, we'll sorry, bear with me a second. Oh, there we go. There we are. Yes, uh, we can represent this graphically. And, or, and, and we can see that um, in, in Hertfordshire, we're able to, we're able to uh, process more than three quarters of our, of our recyclables in the United Kingdom. Sorry, I'm hearing my, I'm getting some feedback. Um, and, and, and more than half indeed reprocessed in the East of England region. So um, in terms of the miles that materials are being taken to be turned into new commodities, um, we can be reasonably satisfied that a very significant proportion of material is processed, uh, not just in the United Kingdom, but in the, in, in the immediate locality. We'll see that uh, in the case of organics in just a minute, but it also applies to significant proportions of the um, dry recyclables as well. Some material is exported, but as, as we'll show later on, um, it's exported under, under strict regulatory regimes uh, and with, a, with an audit trail. So in Hertfordshire, we can be confident that the material is being taken to reputable plants um, even when it goes abroad. And I'll, I'll uh, hope to be able to demonstrate that to you by showing the sort of audit system that we operate a little bit later on. But before we do that, can we see the next slide which outlines what happens to the organic materials? Thank you. So, um, so the third, the third component of the waste that we've been discussing, the, the garden waste, the food waste, the so-called organic fraction. Again, people will be familiar with the collection systems. They have a separate food waste collection, as seven authorities in, in Hertfordshire now have. Um, they'll probably have a container like the one uh, on, the, on the top left, uh, which they set out weekly for a vehicle similar to the one in the left photograph to come and collect. Uh, if they have a garden waste scheme, uh, they, or if, they're participating, if they participate in a garden waste collection scheme, they'll have been perhaps not filled quite so full as that one uh, shown in the picture. The material will be collected on a, a, a familiar bin type lorry, uh, and then um, depending on whether the material is just garden waste or whether it's mixed food and garden waste, it will go to one of the three uh, outcomes at the uh, shown at the bottom. And so reading, uh, going clockwise, reading from um, right to left, the first, the first plant that we can see on that lower picture there is an anaerobic digestion plant where food waste exclusively collectively will be managed. Um, this, this process enables uh, methane to be drawn off the, uh, the food which is processed in vacuum conditions. Uh, and then generate uh, electricity is generated on site and fed to the national grid. Um, uh, uh, if, you, if you get an opportunity to visit a, a, a nanorobic digestion plant, they are, they are fascinating, as indeed are all these organic processing facilities. The, the next illustration shows a windrow facility, which is for uh, garden waste, which doesn't have food waste. Oh, in. Sorry, David. No, it's okay. The, the, Garden waste, which doesn't have food waste in it, can be treated um, in uh, you, you, using a, a, a system very similar to home composting. It doesn't need to be treated. It doesn't need to be heat treated because the food waste doesn't need to be. Um, uh, if it has no food waste in it, um, the the regulations that govern the management of uh, organic waste are less stringent. Um, food waste uh, may contain harmful pathogens. 
uh, and therefore um, the anaerobic digestion or in-vessel composting uh, approaches are required, but pure garden waste can simply be treated on a large scale composting basis. So uh, this is an open windrow facility. Uh, we have some uh, neighboring the authority as we'll see in a minute. Uh, and the material is simply shredded and laid out in uh, and laid out in rows and then turned from time to time to produce a compost uh, that uh, can be spread on farmers' fields or used uh, or used in domestic gardening. And then the third uh, method used in used in Hertfordshire, the last picture of going round clockwise, uh, depicts an in-vessel composting facility where combined. Um, garden and food waste can be treated under heat conditions in that sort of greenhouse uh, behind uh, the top of the picture. Um, the material is, 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 is heat treated uh, and this um, has, the, uh, has the consequence of uh, killing any harmful pathogens in the food waste component and again produces a, um, a compost-like material that can, be, that can be spread on farmers' fields. Uh, and, uh, and if we go on to the next slide, we can see that um, in Hertfordshire, um, almost all of the organic material is dealt with either in county or pretty well on our doorstep. Uh, and so we have a range of facilities. Uh, we have several anaerobic digestion plants, very advanced facilities for dealing with food waste. We have some in-vessel composting plants, which can deal with both food and biogas. Cattlegate Farm Enfield is one of them. Uh, We've just been in, there. In, 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 indeed, uh, uh, just outside the boundary um, material at Cattlegate Farm, uh, uh, um, uh, an open windrow plant. It, it, has a, it has other facilities there as well, but at the moment, Hertfordshire, uh, waste is uh, a Hertfordshire garden waste for open windrow composting is is taken there, uh, as well as to a facility just outside the county in Suffolk. But uh, um, the methods for treating organic waste are a sort of homegrown success story for for Hertfordshire very very emphatically. So um, I mentioned that we were um, able to trace the uh, the waste um, that we collect and the recyclables that we collect. And if we go on to the next slide, this shows the auditing system that all 11 members of the Hertfordshire Waste Partnership in, and indeed all local authorities across the United Kingdom are obliged to uh, follow. The system is known as Waste Data Flow. Um, it's, um, it's overseen by DEFRA, the government department responsible for waste in the environment. And it requires uh, all local authorities on a quarterly basis to account for all the material that they have uh, that they have collected and processed. Uh, the material will, uh, it, 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 and this is done in the form of um, logging Weybridge returns and uh, invoices, and because of course a lot of the dry recyclable material is actually sold, so it's a commercial transaction. Uh, and then the the uh, the fate of the materials is recorded to a considerable detail. If you if if you if you look at this, um, what we've got on the screen, it, it relates to the records um, uh, um, that generated by Hertfordshire County Council from material collected at the recycling centre network, uh, and and the the particular feature that's been highlighted there is 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 um, scrap metal items collected in the big skips that you may see leaving the sites if you're ever visiting a recycling centre. Um, and you can see that the, the, the record keeping there includes the, the, the principal collector uh, and, and, then, and then even goes as far as the, as the subsidiary uh, companies that that collector has then supplied. So the level of detail um, uh, about, uh, about the, the, the firms that um, process the recyclable materials and other wastes that we collect um, is, is very considerable. Uh, and although, um, it, you know, it, 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 local authorities don't have the resources to carry out spot checks and inspections and things like that, this is a trust system. Uh, and, and, and clearly there, 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 there can be and are from time to time, as we see on the television, instances of, of materials being dumped or not being treated effectively. Um, we, 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 we take this extremely seriously. Uh, and, and we have strong records and strong accounts of where the material goes, and we can be we can be confident that the material is being is being treated 
uh, in accordance with stringent national and international regulations. Um, so, Duncan, if we can if we can move on to the next and final section of our of our presentation, which is to um, review how all this knowledge about what happens to our waste um, and what's in our waste um, helps us determine our priorities and helps us um, shape our our um, our program and our policies. So the first thing to we we might want to uh, I'm, I'm suggesting we have a little look at is is to return to that finding that uh, more than eight percent of the uh, uh, of the average bin um, is made up of disposable nappies. Um, the presence of disposable nappies in the in the waste stream has been known to us for for some time, and we have uh, we have had uh, initiatives to encourage people to use. Um, reusable nappies to encourage uh, parents and carers of young children to consider reusable nappies for some time. But um, we've recently revised our program uh, and, and, uh, and a timely revision to, to um, take to uh, respond to this finding of such a significant presence of disposable nappies. Um, we have a Hertfordshire Reusable Nappies Initiative. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. And the intention here is, is not simply to provide people with access to discounted nappies, but uh, a very, uh, we have been able to negotiate significant discounts on the price of reusable nappies with some leading UK suppliers. But we also uh, want to provide the best possible support and guidance to people who may be a little bit daunted about the prospect of reusable nappies. They may remember the nappies that they perhaps grew, grew up in terries with um, sharp pins, uh, and leakages, um, and uh, our message is that um, there's a network of people who are, who are um, uh, happy to share their experiences of using reusable nappies and using new uh, uh, techniques, new manufacturing processes for the nappies themselves, so that they're both um, stylish and uh, perhaps more to the point, effective uh, in containing the, <laughs> the leaks and spillages and things like that associated with um, traditional terry nappies in the past and we uh, our hearts reusable nappy scheme uh, is designed to uh, both provide discounted uh, access to reusable nappies but also to provide a warm welcoming advisory service um, uh, for for people who might be considering reusable nappies uh, and finally on the on reusable nappies i should say that we have uh, another um, another uh, sust fest event um, um, promoted by waste aware um, a nappy natter, uh, which uh, our colleague Helena Jackson will be will be leading. I think it's tomorrow, but uh, we've got a list of uh, other um, uh, waste aware events at the end of this presentation. So uh, that's the reusable nappies. The next slide, uh, please, Duncan. Um, and and of course, as we've been discussing. Uh, a very another significant uh, finding from the from the waste composition study, the the very significant proportion of uh, what we categorise as um, characterise as avoidable food waste, food waste which could have been eaten. Um, this very significant presence, um, we feel that uh, we we need to reconsider our approaches to. Um, encouraging people to uh, buy food more solicitously uh, and, and we're developing a new campaign um, which will review existing campaigns aimed at, uh, aimed at um, tackling food waste to see which ones have are scalable and which ones can uh, demonstrate some some results in, in perhaps reaching people who are not uh, not normally reached by these sorts of initiatives and um, uh, and at the same time, um, you, you know, we're, we're looking to work with uh, with with farmers and with retailers to to try and build a Hertfordshire coalition, if you like, against uh, against food waste. This is very early, uh, very early days, but um, we we you can expect to see um, more promotion, more publicity about the challenge of food waste um, as we as we go forward, based on um, our findings from our waste composition studies. And if we go on to the next slide, Duncan, I'm going to invite you to, to um, begin to wrap up, perhaps by considering how um, at the findings that we've been discussing help Hertfordshire 
uh, contribute to the government's current review of um, waste management policy? Thank you, David. Um, so one of, the, one of the themes along here is about how data influences policy. And we are now at one of those very rare moments um, in, in um, the sort of public sector environment sector in that we are currently working hard to respond to three uh, government consultations um, that will fundamentally change how our sector operates in the future. Um, the parent uh, legislation or document for these changes is the government's resources and waste strategy, which came out at the back end of 2018. The first round of consultations um, about the changes uh, rolling out in early 2019. Um, it was intended that the second and final round would, would have been done last year, but obviously, like a lot of things, COVID-19 got in the way. So we are currently into the consultations now. Um, and these represent the biggest structural changes to our sector since the Environmental Protection Act 1990, so you know, 30 odd years ago. And prior to that, you'd have to go back to the 1974 Control of Pollution Act to see something as big, and this is bigger. I sort of slightly joke that if I remain fit and well, I have another 17 years left in service before I retire. Um, I will not see something this big again. These consultations are one of those rare opportunities where various stakeholders from, from local government officers to civil servants, to the private sector, to individuals, to residents associations can place a very small but important finger on the, on the tiller of public policy. And they're broken down into, into three proposals. The first is something we call exchange of producer responsibility. Some members of the audience may be aware that uh, the, the producers of packaging currently are subject to a range of different targets that are defined by the amount of packaging they are, they are responsible for putting onto the marketplace. Been around since the late 1990s, um, was designed to deliver a UK system at lowest cost. Uh, and there was a whole bunch of issues with it. Uh, and all those issues are going to be hopefully addressed in a brand new regime that's due to be rolled out in two to three years time. Something we, we, we colloquially refer to as EPR. From a local government perspective, one of the key changes is this. At the moment, the cost of managing post-consumer packaging, so that's packaging materials that you either put out in your recycling or for some households that don't recycle and put it into the residual waste bin, the cost of that, the cost of that collection operation, and the onward management of that post-consumer packaging falls to the public purse, comes out of um, local taxation uh, and the very small amount of revenue support grant we now get from central government, but it comes out of public funding. EPR will make the producers pay for that. So once EPR, the idea is that once the EPR regime is up and running, the full net cost of managing post-consumer packaging will then fall to the producers. They will have to fund local government operations uh, on a full net cost basis. Now, it's not as simple as it sounds, because if you bear in mind, food waste won't be covered by EPR. Things like newspapers and magazines, not covered by EPR. Uh, disposable nappies, not covered by EPR. So it's not the entire cost of what we do, but it is a very significant proportion of it, which is one of the other reasons and motivating factors behind the waste composition analysis. We needed to establish exactly how much post-consumer packaging we are dealing with as a basis for a dialogue with, with government. Um, the second phase of these changes is something called consistency, um, which is the second bullet point on the slide here, collecting a consistent set of dry recyclables and food waste from all households and businesses. At the moment, uh, when you cross a boundary uh, you know, uh, on a map, um, the local authority is fully within its rights to completely and utterly reinvent the wheel and collect a completely different range of materials. Um, the government has quite rightly, in my view, been long frustrated with that arrangement. And as a result, um, they are bringing in something called consistency, which once it's implemented in law, will require all um, authorities in England, Wales, and there are similar proposals in Scotland, to collect the same range of materials from both householders, and that's householders in houses, as well as householders in flats, um, the same range of dry recyclables and food waste, which for those in the houses is likely to be done uh, specified in law. It will have to be a separate weekly collection of food waste. And those same services will also have to be rolled out to businesses. Um, 
we, we tend to, in local government, focus on household waste, but when we look at the commercial waste stream, it's much, much bigger. And therefore, government are bringing in the same rules for uh, commercial wastes and for commercial waste operators. So whether it's a local council dealing with a householder or a private waste company collecting business from a chain of restaurants, the same rules will apply. Hence the term consistency. Now, to be absolutely clear, other than possibly food waste, the government haven't strayed into that, and this is how we want you to collect. So the method of collection will still be down to um, individual local councils. But what we can say, if we were doing a, a, a more of a historical look back at Hertfordshire, you'd see that the degree of variation in how we collect recycling now compared to, um, say, even 10 years ago is much, much less. And we expect that trend to continue such that over time, not only Hertfordshire, but large parts of the country evolve towards very similar collection systems. As part of those two agendas, labeling on the products that you buy from supermarkets will also have to change. And rather than the, the current labeling system where you have these, these rather vague descriptions about something that either is recycled or it's widely recycled or not widely recycled or contact your local council, all that will go and you'll have a very binary system. Either it is recyclable at the curbside or it is not. Um, so those are two fundamental developments. The third one, for some of you in the audience, uh, and I certainly can remember this myself, um, is something called a deposit return scheme where you'll be able to take back selected packaged beverages to retailers to redeem a deposit that will be put on the purchase of those beverage packages at the point of initial sale. Um, we refer to it correctly as DRS. Um, I can certainly remember doing it when I was a kid or more accurately, nicking bottles from my neighbor's bin and taking them to the corner shop. The government are proposing to bring that system back. Scotland are probably 12 months ahead of us. They're looking to implement their DRS in July next year. Uh, and if an English DRS goes ahead, I suspect it will be largely informed by that. But those are three key proposals. Funnily enough, as of this morning, Hertfordshire has finalized uh, or sent for final approval uh, in, term, in terms of internal processes, the, our collective responses to DRS and EPR. Uh, the, the consistency consultation came out somewhat late um, and the deadline's not until July, so we're currently working on that one as well. But as I say, these are three of the biggest developments in the last 30 years, uh, and we won't see something this big again for another 30, 40 years. This will set the framework going forward for the next 30 or 40 years. By themselves, they will take five to 10 years to bed in properly. There will be unintended consequences, which we are trying to think about now in our responses. Um, so they will take some time to, to, to be fully implemented and fully bedded in. But frankly, it's quite an exciting time again in waste. I, I joined the industry in the early 90s. And if I look at my class of the early 90s, those colleagues that I joined with and where they are now, for the first time in probably 10 years, there is genuine excitement in their work there is a genuine bounce in the step because they realize that how fundamentally different this potential change is all right let's move on yes great well i think that's uh we're, we're coming to the close of the presentation now uh but um it, yeah a note to finish on that you know we are at a very significant point in the in the in in the sort of history of waste management in the uk um, and we're looking to uh, move the waste management agenda forward alongside the climate change uh, agenda uh, as an important component of our response to climate change uh, and um, realizing the full um, opportunities of this consultative process um, with a, a well-informed uh, submission uh, commenting on the proposals that the government has made and Duncan's leading that uh, uh, effort on behalf of the Hertfordshire Waste Partnership. Uh, and it's an extremely stimulating uh, process to be involved in. I concur with his with his comments. But to conclude, can we first of all um, draw to your attention some other events which Waste Aware are promoting at the uh, at, at SustFest, and some of which I mentioned in the in the presentation uh, earlier. Um, uh, two tomorrow, um, if you're if you're fascinated and irritated by the problem of fly tipping, um, then tomorrow morning uh, you can hear from Duncan again and some of his colleagues on, on um, the, the excellent work done by the Hertfordshire Fly Tipping Group, uh, nationally recognised uh, methods for 
um, really moving against the perpetrators of uh, fly tipping and getting effective ways of clearing up fly tipping. Um, a fascinating, uh, fascinating and successful initiative, again, uh, based here in Hertfordshire. Uh, and then on the same day, another a very successful initiative from uh, developed by our colleague Helena Jackson, who is uh, um, behind the scenes on this particular uh, event, but to, tomorrow will be taking centre stage, um, uh, uh, talking informally about the use of um, reusable nappies and how the uh, reusable nappy experience has moved on from, uh, from what I remember as a parent uh, 30 years ago uh, and now. Um, uh, represents a genuine uh, opportunity for uh, people who, who also want to do something about um, the amount of waste that uh, is generated by disposable nappies. And then uh, later in the week, um, we have uh, a feature on uh, how you can uh, imaginatively use your uh, your leftovers to make uh, to make delicious lunches. There was going to be a live demonstration by a local uh, local author and uh, food uh, commentator, Becky Alexander. That's going to be a, a, a really exciting initiative. Uh, then on on Friday, uh, we're, we've got a, a feature on plastic free periods, looking at alternative ways of uh, sanitary protection. We've got some of our uh, women colleagues uh, talking about that, which I think will be very interesting. And then finally, next week, we have um, uh, another food waste focused initiative, uh, um, a, a project um, uh, promoted by uh, West Hertfordshire College in Watford, where students have been uh, looking at how they can help uh, people cope with uh, leftovers uh, and uh, looking at uh, vegan approaches to minimizing food waste by producing delicious food in a simple and straightforward way. And again, there are going to be some uh, cookery demonstrations and exciting, uh, an exciting event to bring our involvement in SUSFest to a conclusion. So uh, please do check out those events. There are still places available. Uh, use, the, um, use the Eventbrite uh, system to uh, book onto them. And then finally, um, Duncan, thank you. Um, uh, we are available for <laughs> we're available you know on tour if uh, if you would, <laughs> if you are if you are involved in a group or a voluntary group uh, and you would like uh, this presentation or a, a similar presentation uh, and indeed this team of presenters uh, you know we 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 are available um, and as COVID uh, restrictions relax. Um, we, we, uh, we very much enjoy coming and meeting people in person and we would like to do that, um, but certainly we're available uh, for online presentations as well uh, and we're happy to come and speak to a community, community group if they're interested in waste and recycling. Uh, 20 or so is the kind of number that, um, that, that sort of, uh, you know, enables us to reach a reasonable number of people. Uh, if you would like, uh, if you'd like to consider that or like us to consider, uh, please contact Duncan. He's bravely agreed for his email address to go up on the screen there. Uh, and um, thank you very much. We've enjoyed presenting to you. We hope, you, we hope you've en enjoyed hearing what we've had to say. Uh, and now I think we're going to be able to dip into the, uh, into the questions on the, on the um, on the message boards, are we, Duncan? Fire away. We've we I know Helen has um, been uh, posting as we've been going along, and I tried to keep up initially, but gave it up as a bad job because I'm not the quickest typist. So if, now now's your opportunity. Happy yes, to thank you, everybody, um, for posting your questions. There have been a lot of questions. I've tried to respond to as many as I can as we've been through, but. <laughs> I thought were actually better um, given a verbal response. So the first one is when will flats be included in recycling? Uh, flats, uh, it, it, it differs depending on which borough and district we're talking about. Some of the boroughs and districts um, are much more advanced than others. The good news is that the consistency consultation will require the same level of provision to um, households living in flats as it does houses. Uh, and that is due for implementation probably at the moment, 23, 24, Oh, I think you will find that for those currently without services, we'll probably um, see those services rolled out sooner than that timeline would be my imagination. The, the timing of that is down to individual and bars and districts. That's not something we dictate from the centre. Um, but um, what I will say is my colleagues across um, the country, let alone Harpshire, are well aware of 
the legislative changes that are coming and are already moving to, to update and change services in line with those. So I would expect new flat services to be rolled out forthwith. I mean, many councils, it's true to say, is it not done have planning regulations now, which mean that developers of new flats, perhaps for the past five years or so, must make provision, must make space provision and uh, secure provision for, um, uh, and, and indeed future-proof pr pr provision for the storage of targeted recyclables. So yes, yes. Most, most developers will, and, and indeed most, uh, most local authority officers will be commenting on proposals from developers to check that sufficient space and sufficient convenience uh, is, um, is, is informing uh, proposals for, for um, for recycling facilities and waste management facilities and new developments. The challenge is in retrofitting older blocks of flats, blocks of flats built before say 2010. I think that's where we, um, you know, where we're going to, where, where, where they may have had refuse shoot systems, which may now be uh, being decommissioned for sort of fire safety uh, reasons, as well as for um, waste management reasons. And so the challenge I think we face in the flat sector is, is in retrofitting older flats where space may be at a premium. Um, uh, and, you know, there will be, need to be some imaginative solutions um, for- David, I'm gonna stop you there because we have a lot of questions. Yeah, okay. sorry. That one fairly well. Um, one that's come up quite a lot is about plastics. Where does it go? Um, what can we do with it? Uh, does it all get recycled? It doesn't go and get burnt on some foreign shores somewhere. Please tell us a bit more about that. Um, it, it, we, we know that uh, a lot of the plastics, um, uh, actually a significant proportion of the plastics is reprocessed actually in the United Kingdom and made into products that include garden furniture and other, and other materials. Um, other plastics is exported, um, but it's sold. Um, and and the, the, uh, we, we, know, we know where it goes to, and we know that the um, domestic uh, environmental agencies in those countries um, have an obligation to ensure that the material is processed correctly. So um, while it's, it, it certainly is the case that some plastics material in particular is mismanaged, um, we're reasonably confident the material in Hertfordshire is 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 properly stewarded, um, whether it's reprocessed in this country or whether it's exported. I mean, Duncan, is there anything you want to add to that? It, just to be aware that um, you know the the UK waste management industry is not only about local government and what we do. Um, the commercial business to business sector is far bigger than local government. Uh, and they will be um, exporting to the same markets as us. From a local government perspective, it's very rare it's the local council that will take the decision to export. What happens in practice is that once you collect your materials, the way we collect them, as, as the majority of the country does, they will take them to a privately operated materials recycling facility. The commercial decision on whether to export or not is taken by the commercial company, not the local councils. The long-term solution to this, 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 this conundrum um, is to create the right environment that would encourage the private sector to invest in UK both reprocessing capacity, which fundamentally would remove the need to export the very small amount that we still do. Um, whilst, as you saw in, David, in the presentation that, that David put together, you know, 86% 80, of the materials that we can't recycle or compost stay in the UK, there is a small element that still goes abroad. Uh, abroad. And our collective obligation, our collective objective in terms of local government, central government, is to see what we can do to create the right circumstances that can persuade reprocessors to, to recycle that material physically in this country. Um, but that's more of a long-term aim. Okay, thank you. So another question was about household waste. And in one of your charts, you showed that the total household waste was going down. And the question is, what are we generating less of? Uh, I'll give you a good example. When I when I took on this post, even though I worked in London previously, I, because of professional associations or what have you, I used to go to train on the train on a regular basis. And one of my annoyances on the train when I started going was um, everyone with a great big broadsheets reading newspapers. If you go on the train now, you don't see that. You see a lot of people on, on, on electronic devices. So there, there, there are quite a few changes in, in the way that we're behaving that are impacting on, on what we're throwing away. Um, paper and fiber being one of them. Um, currently, 
um, partly because of COVID, there's far more packaging in the waste stream than there is newspapers and magazines. It used to be the other way around. So um, we are generating and consuming less physical goods and we're, 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 we're switching to some online habits as, as a consequence. Um, we, are, we are seeing a small, um, shallow trend, a reduction in the amount of food waste. Um, back in 2015, I think across the counties as a whole, we, we had something like 33% uh, of our residual bin was food waste. It's now 28%. So a bona fide real terms reduction, but um, much, more, more, much more work to do. So the good news is it's going down um, and we need to continue it and accelerate that if we can. And, and isn't it the case just uh, that, that initiatives like extended producer responsibility, as well as providing funding for local councils, will also encourage businesses to do more to lock weight and reduce the amount of, of packaging that they use? Because obviously they're going to pay for it. So, it. so there will be a double impact of this initiative. It will generate resources for local councils to do more recycling, but it will also, perhaps more importantly, encourage manufacturers to find innovative ways to further reduce the amount of material that goes into making the packaging in, in the first place. And you know, if you want an example of that that's already happened, look at the PET bottle. You know, 20 years ago, it had a black cap on the bottom and it was rigid. Now it's a flimsy, flimsy device that only weighs about half of what it weighed before. So we've got a trend of encouraging business to um, lightweight the packaging. There's another question about um, the recycling isn't the answer. Um, it was mentioned that this was a false economy and that what we need to do is reduce our food waste and stop single use items. So um, I've just popped a link on to our Remember Your Reusable campaign. And there's lots of um, tips or suggestions there for swapping away from single use items and moving towards reusable items. And a nice plug for some of our upcoming events, as you heard David saying, um, it's one about um, reusable nappies or plastic free periods. Um, there was another question about how we can reduce our food waste. And obviously we've got two events coming up for them. So you'll be able to find a lot more. Um, and I've just seen, yes, we have recorded obviously this. We have too many questions to respond to today. We are rapidly running out of time. Um, so yes, we any questions that we haven't answered, I will ask David and Duncan to comment on. I will circulate that with the link to the recording. So if you've not had your answer yet, it will come um, later. Um, so what else? Um, there were some specific ones about the upcoming consultations. I think they're probably left for another time because that can be quite an in-depth um, response. Quite a few people said that they'd like to learn about what happens with supermarket waste or business waste. Obviously that's beyond the scope of this, but I'm thinking possibly another event at some point might be possible. Um, starch bags, compostable coffee pup cups has come up. I've shared a link again to our page. Um, it is a quite a nuanced and complex um, interaction there, but um, we've given you quite a lot of details on our web page. So food waste again. Do people misunderstand or overreact about this before date stamp? Yes, I'm going to be slightly controversial and say yes. I mean, I get this question from friends and family. I have a standard response, use your eyes and use your nose and trust your gut. Um, dates were a well-intentioned safety feature uh, brought in in response to a number of uh, historical issues. But uh, I think they are far too black and white. I think, um, you know, the key in terms of food waste management is literally to trust, trust your nose, trust what you see and smell. Um, you know, I, my sister, I shouldn't really pick on her, it's not fair, she's not here, it, it's terrible for this. If it's out of date, she doesn't use it. Well, I'm like, well, really? You know, if, 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 a, if a yogurt is a few days out of date, um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to consume it and I, and I trust my own judgment. So yes, I my personal view is that yes, people overreact to dates, which causes some of the problem. And I think you'll find that, um, I believe I'm right in saying that some of the supermarkets have changed the way they date, date products now to try and encourage the use uh, and, and not the opposite. Thank you. Another question here is how can the elderly be helped with the disposal of recycling? Most local authorities, if not all, run an assist list. So if there's a particular household that has a, uh, a disability or some other issue that is preventing them from fully taking part in either a waste collection and or uh, recycling process, then as I say, most run an assist list 
um, I would recommend you contact your local council um, and ask for your name to be put onto that list um, through which um, additional assistance can be rendered. That said, we, we typically find that if someone is largely able to get their, you know, their consumption in terms of their shopping into the household, then there's normally a way to get their recycling waste management out um, as a general rule. But if you are particularly in a situation or you know someone that has that, that as an issue, then I would recommend contacting your local council who should be able to help. Thank you. One that I have worked, asked um, a few times is why don't all councils have the same procedures? So, uh, so the same collection methods. Yeah, it's a really, it's a fantastic question. It's the bane of um, my professional life. Um, fundamentally, the decision is one that the government historically have refused to dictate. Um, it's not something they've ever wanted to get involved in because it can be quite a local political issue and therefore government has always stayed away from it. The consistency consultation, uh, and I would suggest if you ever have time to read them, some of the intended drivers and levers in, in, the, in the EPR and the DRS consultations are, are designed to make government think about how it joins up collection methods across um, boundaries on a map. But at the moment, it, that's still a local government decision although the consistency will be specifying a core set. Um, I would love to live in a world where we're collecting it the same way. And in large parts of the country, we are. You know, in Cambridgeshire and Suffolk, you'll find there is a very, very great deal of alignment in the way they collect recycling, um, as well as residual waste and organics. In Hertfordshire, we largely collect all our refuse the same way. Um, we did, to a point, collect all our organics the same way, although we are going through a process of evolution in that system with food waste now being separated out again for separate collections to be specified in law um, and you know 10 years ago we literally had 10 different dry recycling systems now we've probably got about three or four covering 10 boroughs and in response to the um, three consultations that I mentioned towards the end of the presentation I expect to see further alignment um, in terms of those collection systems and the trick will be to make sure that individual boroughs and districts don't have those conversations in isolation. That, that is a mistake. What we need to do, and through the partnership, we need those boroughs and districts to discuss those uh, initial ideas at a very early stage and look for opportunities to align collection practices. So, for example, you know, if I'm, if I'm a single district buying five vehicles, I'll get a certain price when I go out to market. But if I can combine the you know, the needs of 10 boroughs buying 50 vehicles, then you'll get those vehicles at a much better price. Um, and those are the sorts of conversations that we, we uh, and the work that we do on a regular basis in the Heart Space Partnership. Really good question. Yeah, as you can see, it's a lot more complicated than just, we need to collect X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I've just, um, just a question pop up. Do we have to wash recyclables before... Um, um, cold. As you as see, see that was shared, shared um, actual people picking items. So yes, so, yes a rinse. We don't want kind of solid residue. We don't want any mold or items. They do not have to be spotless. Yeah. So just so different. The end of your washing up water is absolutely fine. Um, I have a minute left. So I was going to touch on um, ter ter TerraCycle. Sadly, we have run out of time. Um, I'm just going to post a link uh, just to share a few more. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out. Sorry, there's a little bit of echo here, um, which you can which line up by you and get all sorts of information about our different campaigns. Um, and of course, this is just the beginning of the fest. There are many more events, both from us and other people. So please do. Yes, if everyone could try muting. I don't. Sorry about the echo. Um, if, uh, if you would like to share more events, I've got some details um, for you to do that. The hashtag for the Suspest um, motion. Um, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, thanks, Duncan, everybody. Do you want to say anything else? No. Nope. Just uh, obviously, we'll, um, we'll endeavour to answer any questions that we haven't got to. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.